Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and once again I'm joined by Jim Simonetti where today we will be speaking to Gary Aitken. Welcome to the show Gary. Thank you very much. We're in the uh, Cathkin Park Clubhouse. What's your thoughts of coming back into this historic area of Scottish football? It's phenomenal. Um, for something that not many people know is here, it's a phenomenal facility and a, an absolute tribute and, uh, to obviously to Jinky, um, his legacy and obviously what guys are doing here is superb, absolutely superb. It's like a TARDIS, isn't it? Uh, un- unbelievable, as I say, it's, it's one of the old um, community centres type buildings that you, you know, that you kind of look at and you think, nothing there. It's going to be locked up and you, walk, you walk into it and wow, absolutely wow. It's brilliant. And you never ever take it for granted. Every time I walk in, I think, oh, I know. I, I think, know. wow, every time. So they are. And the different stories that all different people from different walks in life have got about Jimmy Johnson's fantastic. But to hear Gary, he, the way he's speaking there and he's looking about at the photographs on the, on the wall and you can see he's genuinely touched by what he sees in here and the era of football that's represented in here. So I think it's brilliant. Thanks very much for the... He had a nice compliment there, Gary, as well. Oh, it's well deserved. Absolutely well deserved. <laughs> the first time you went to see Celtic, Gary, you did see in the flesh the famous Jimmy Johnston. So what's your memories of seeing wee Jinky? To be fair, not many. Um, I was pretty, pretty young, to be fair. Um, as I say, for me, um, I, I look at the way that football was played at that time and obviously it wasn't contained the way it's contained now, but the, the players that were there were years and years ahead of their time um, whether that's down to Jock Steen just a phenomenal team, you know, absolutely phenomenal team and mm-hmm. as I say, as you go forward it's to, to probably the era that I didn't know better um, unfortunately we weren't as good but we had some phenomenal players as well but that was just a fantastic era Absolutely, now we've spoken to people who's Introduction to Celtic was probably different from others. So, for example, I remember Celtic being an omnipresence in my house because all my family supported them. You're eventually taken to the games, etc. But we've also spoken to people like Sean Farland Jr., whose obviously experiences are different because the the way that they go to the game is going to be different. On a personal level, I speak to Neely Mocking a lot, and his experiences were going to be different because that was his dad's work. Right. So talk to us about your connections, your family connections to Celtic Football Club. Yeah, when you mentioned Sean, Sean's a good pal of mine. Um, because obviously my great uncle uh, was Sir Robert Kelly. Uh, my my grandmother's sister was married to Sir Robert. Um, so my mum was obviously friendly with the Fallons. So we've known the Fallons for a long, long time. Um and believe it or not, we're very, very friendly, <laughs> despite the fact it was the director, sort of manager role type thing, which most people would think was strange in, in those days, because it probably was a bit. But but Sean's a very endearing guy as an old man, and uh, and young Sean's a, a really good guy as well. So I was honoured to speak to his dad. I spent some time with him when I was writing the Quality Street Gang book, and I still say it's the best interview I've ever experienced. Special guy, special man. Uh, First thing he done, Gary, was he took my hand and he pushed it into his collar. And he says, that's why I'm called Iron Man. And then he told me the story, you know, <laughs> about his collarbone coming <laughs> out of place. And uh, it was it was really, I was like a wee boy talking to a superhero that day, talking to Sean. Uh, but humble, humble man as well, you know. And um, as I say, really, really fond of my mum. Um, and as I say, just a really, really nice, nice family. Really nice family. You spoke to us earlier about some memories of you maybe waiting outside the games. And, you know, you've got an experience that that Jim and I maybe don't have, you know, seen behind the curtain, if you like, of the way that Celtic operate. And there was a brilliant recollection you had by this time, Billy McNeil's in charge of the club. And it's the old fascia before it was uh, redone in 87. And Desmond White's taking you home. Yeah, you were waiting in the car. Uh, yeah, I, well, I was waiting outside, sitting in the chair outside um, Billy's office, um, and it was one of those ones of just sitting, waiting to go home, and all you can hear is tirades of shouting and swearing and just language, like probably. Uh, it wasn't wasn't something my dad would shout at my mum, so, <laughs> so it was just. It, but it did show 
you know, as I say, as I look back at it now, it shows the real passion that even the directors had as well. You know, they, they were Celtic fans. Um, but I say they were certainly going going for it, and I stand, never said a word on the way home in the car with, with Desmond. <laughs> As a wee kid, ah, exactly, (laughs) exactly. Your first game, memorable in different ways, wasn't it? I mean, Jimmy was on the pitch that day, but he got injured early doors. Yeah, I I think, um, to be fair, um, quite unique in that most Celtic families only have one, one, only have one side. Um, My my father and my uncle and and the others were party thistle directors. So, um, Celtic won, obviously. Yeah, but uh, my first my first memory was not of Celtic winning. You know, it was obviously the the four one game, and I was kind of sitting um, with with my dad in one half of the director's box for half a game, and one half of it with my mum. Uh, my dad was delighted, and my mum was raging. So I, I don't really remember too much about it because I was um, I think I was four years old at the time, but. Uh, but I, I remember it being talked about, you know, especially Christmas times and, and things like that. You know, and my uncle was that he lived and dined out in that for a long time. Um, so. I was moving into obviously the a great number of the lines were still there, but they were, you know, they had a team underneath them, the Quality Street Gang, who were coming through as well, moving into the nineteen seventies. When did you start going at an age where? You know, four, I think, think to myself, that's really young. Yeah, I think that was because it was kind of a special occasion yeah. for, for the family because you, you, mm-hmm. you don't get a chance usually that uh, somebody in the family is guaranteed to be happy in Glasgow. You know? so, and unexpectedly, yeah, it was your, yeah. your dad yeah. and your uncle. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So. I've spoken to George Conley about that game, actually. Big Billy was missing, wasn't he, from the lineup? Bye. And Wee Jinky got injured by Ronnie Glavin, mm-hmm. early doors. Kenny Dalglish scores in the second half. He never scored in a cup final that Celtic won. King Kenny, yeah. when you start getting into it yourself, was he a big hero for you, oh, Gary? Phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Again, four hundred and forty thousand, never enough for that man. You know, even you know, even back then, it wasn't enough for him. Um, he was just, in, in, fairness, in fairness to him, you know, I think probably the way Celtic's wage structure was and everything else, he couldn't take his family any further than than, than he did uh, in Glasgow. Um, and no Celtic fan could ever ask for any more than they did for them as, as a player. Yeah, so, but I was gutted. <laughs> yeah, and probably the next great hero would probably have been Charlie Nick. Yeah, and when he came along, that's you know, you know talking, you're talking cult hero. Then at, at that stage, you're talking so. Um, but again, I think Charlie. Uh, I think he went to Arsenal for nine hundred quid a week, and you know, <laughs> for, we were never going to compete me, with that. You know, and. I mean, when you think Tommy going to come on it, and, you know, and uh, don't like to say because obviously the family are still alive, but the wages he was on were ridiculous for, for somebody. And, and you go back to obviously all the Lisbon lines, it's a disgrace, really, you know, um, what they were earning for what they were and what they did for the club. But I think that, as we talked through next door, that was a real transitional period in, in Celtic's history and in football in general, I think. So. There's a view, looking back, Gary, that so Robert Kelly, uh, obviously in the in the kind of early stages when Celtic weren't winning as much, they had a, a good group of players in the fifties, and they would win. You know, they won the double, they won the Coronation Cup. There was a seven-one game, but it was only when Jock Steen comes in that they enjoy the domination that Steen brought and the European conquering teams that he built. But there was, there is a view amongst um, Celtic fans that when Sir Robert Kelly stood down and was replaced, there was a sea change in the way that Celtic were run. So, for example, you've mentioned Kenny Dalglish there. Celtic never cashed in on any of the Lisbon lines. You know, maybe before that, with Paddy Crerand and Bobby Collins, Willie Fernie, we did cash in on our greatest assets. But Celtic started to become a sailing club again. Yeah, I think um, it, it, at that time, I don't think there was that much of a, a difference in terms of what Manchester United players would have been earning to what Celtic players would have been earning. Manchester United players have been earning more money, but not double the money, you know. So, and I think they were they were young guys who were lauded and loved, um, and probably you know yourself when you're twenty six, twenty seven, you never think anything's going to end, you know. And you don't, you know. It's just, I think Jock Steen said um, at one stage, you know, footballers when they get to thirty four should be shot, you know. <laughs> 
like a racehorse yeah, that's getting, yeah, out to grass yeah, yeah. effectively you know that was um, and he wasn't saying it for any other reason than um, they weren't they weren't now I think it's different where they, they reap the rewards of you know at, at that stage they had to save everything to get a pub <laughs> you know that that was the football was their chance to create a career after football as opposed to now you're actually getting the rewards for being a footballer which which I think is fairer See, when you're looking at that, and there is this big, again, looking back, uh, but even at the time, looking at Kenny Dalglish, comparing the transfer fee to the fee that Liverpool received for Keegan, 500 grand, we only got 440. Do you think there was an element of the bean counters cashing in on the, the goodwill of the Celtic fans and just hoping another conveyor belt of talent would come through rather than investing? I think there probably was an element of that. Um, but how do you replace Kenny Dalglish? You know, and the nicest will in the world. I think at that time, I don't, I, I don't really see anybody, Kevin Keegan. I don't, I don't and okay, Celtic fan, but I don't see anybody being better than Kenny Dalglish at that know, time. At that time, you know, um, and and I don't see how you could replace him. I, I understand, yeah. Sometimes, you, you know, I, I get from Kenny's point of view that. It's a, it's a massive change for him and, and the career he went on to have was absolutely phenomenal and um, and still having, obviously. <laughs> um, so I, I, I can understand why all parties were, you know, were probably happy enough to for Kenny to move. But I just don't see how you could ever replace him. And at the money, I think the money was probably half of what it should be. He probably should have been the first million pound player and at that, at that time, in my opinion, you know, yeah, to think he was that good. Mm -hmm. Trevor Francis, nineteen seventy nine, mm -hmm. one million pounds. I think Brian Clough said it was actually nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine pounds because he didn't want him to get a big head. <laughs> <laughs> Brian Clough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, we're all about trying to get your view on on a lot of things that, uh, in time, have become fact. You know, because people say that's what happened. Sometimes it's a laughing matter. People look back fondly on it as you would look at a Celtic attendance, for example, during the old regime days and they'd look about it and it was mobbed, 36,000 at the game. What's your thoughts on, on the attendances? We had a wee chat about it before we came on. Yeah, I think, uh, well, there's, there's, there's two different eras of attendance, I think. You know, and One goes back to the sack of the Blood era where 15,000 was the break-even point. Um, so you knew that it was going to be 10,000, 12,000, 13,000 because the Celtic fans were, were voting to to remove the dynasties, if you like. Um, prior to that, as I said, I think I said to you through there, you know, there was a period when the gates were halved and, and it wasn't just Celtic that was stealing money. <laughs> every every club when Celtic and Rangers came to play them, there was, it was a cash business. So I don't think it was so much a case of, I think they felt they were, all, everybody felt they were getting what they were entitled to, but obviously the biscuit tin mentality has been mentioned and and I think I said to you, I, I don't necessarily agree with it in, in, in its entirety. Um, I think they're just, you know, maybe a group of people that are about their depth for the way football was evolving at the time. So. You've got a dynasty there, a, a private limited company at that time, and the families that were part of the dynasties were the Grants, the Whites and the Kellys. So your mother's cousin was Kevin Kelly. Yeah, that's good. Was there ever in your mind any kind of ambition or expectation that you might get involved yourself, Gary? I, th I think it was one of those ones when you, you say, when you, you kind of look at it and you, I, I think it was always a very dangerous place to be, you know. Um, on the one hand, if, if you're Chris White, you're thrown into it. You know, I'm not a Kelly as such, but um, Kevin, nicest man in the world, I think, uh, or one of them, certainly. Um, again, because uh, Uncle Bob, then you're, you're put into that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the way, the way football had gone at the time, uh, I think I'd, I'd said to you through there, you know, uh, football directors before freedom of contract controlled everything they controlled whether a player was even going to be playing next season for anybody not necessarily for Celtic or, or whoever um, and you had so you, you had this new group of directors coming through obviously uh, my uncle Bob died and actually my, uh, my big sister's birthday in, in 71 um, so obviously there was, a, there was a sea change from 
uh, from Sir Bob at that stage. Um, but the families were all still the same. And but then you've you've got this new. It's not it's not sibling rivalries. It's just new generations coming in, mm-hmm. um, who didn't have the same level of money um, and couldn't run the football clubs in the same manner that they were um, had been run in the past. And I think it was a, a sea change for for a lot of football clubs. Uh, it's just that obviously everything Celtic does is under the microscope dramatically. Yeah. One of the great things that uh, Sir Bob Kelly did, I mean, there, there was there was many for Celtic and the legacy is there for all to look back on. One of the, the ones that to this day is something that Celtic fight against and Fergus McCann fought against it, flying the Irish tricolour. If you know the history of the famous song, line in the song goes, Celtic are entitled to fly the tricolour. But... So Bob Kelly came up against the Beaks who wanted and demanded that that be taken down. He stood up for the heritage of the club. How proud are you when you look back on that? Absolutely phenomenal. Um, as I say, obviously, it's second-hand information, but, um, but absolutely brilliant. As a, as a Catholic and as a Celtic supporter, uh, I'd, I'd, you know, that's one of the things that sometimes when, when people slag off the families, you're like, well... Do you know what? They might have been reasonably privileged and, and whatever else, but they stood up for what they believed in. Yeah. And I genuinely do believe that. And I, and I think what they did um, was, I, I, I certainly think what he did at that time in a, in a very, as I say, I don't know if I'm, in a very west of Scotland sort of society, then to stand up as uh, as a lone voice effectively and, and manage to achieve what he achieved, brilliant. Absolutely incredible. And being the chairman of the first British club, to win the European Cup yeah absolutely absolutely um, again another just a wee, a wee story that uh, my mum always complains about or complained about was and she's to this day she's adamant it was probably Rangers fans but you never know um, when they came back uh, obviously from Lisbon when they did the, the bus tour around Celtic Park uh, their house got tanned sorry <laughs> when that day their house got tanned <laughs> so so anyway, may not have been Rangers fans, but that was that was always what my mum my felt it was. You know, when as a as a Celtic, I'm not a historian by any manner of means. I've done some research for my yeah. books, but someone who loves Celtic history, like myself, and I know Jim loves Celtic history as well. And we're always looking at the relics. I'm really interested in the Celtic jerseys. You know, the match worn jerseys. When you think of the the dynasties who we've already mentioned, there must be loads of artifacts and, and Celtic curio that exists within the family, or has that just been spread amongst various different areas over the years? Um, I, th- I think probably uh, it's in, in terms of how the families probably looked at it growing up. It was uh, like getting a jersey out of GT Sports, you know, and don't mean that to be, you know, no, no. Uh, it's, it's just it, it probably wasn't as important as it would be if they hadn't been families, you know, if they've yeah. been. I'm not saying they weren't supporters. It just, it's just like you know, um, like my, for, for example, my um, my aunt always used to wear a brooch. Um, God knows where it is, but it was the European Cup. Uh, and then I seen Bobby Murdoch's um, wife with the the wee, the wee badge that um, yeah that my uh, as I say my, my uncle used to wear all the time as well um, and fun, funnily enough in terms of there wasn't a lot of stuff about but uh, when we had obviously we were down in London for the um, 67 uh, 50th anniversary and big Gav Kelly who used to run the uh, Foundation. Uh, he'd invited myself and my wife down, so um, as a wee thank you, I gave him uh, a 1967 Glasgow Cup winners medal and the, that wee that wee badge. You know, but outside of that, we don't have a lot of memorabilia. I don't think it's, it just never seemed to be as important as memories to me. You know? Yeah. Now the badge that you're talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a 1967 one which commemorated all the trophies. Yeah. Yeah. That's I right. know the look of it. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. And interestingly enough, the brooch that you're talking about, there was a picture popped up, Jim Simonetti. You shared a picture because we'd been talking about the portrait of JFK that used to be at Celtic Park. In the boardroom, yes. You spotted a picture, didn't you? That's right. And um, and the brooch was being worn right in front of this, this portrait. Yeah, be, be uh, uh, sort of some Bob's wife. And uh, beautiful, beautiful brooch. When we 
talked about the 1970s, there, there started already to be a bit of a change because I think, and this is again probably hindsight, I don't know how many people thought about it at the time, there was an end of an era when Kenny Dalglish left. Jim thinks there was an end of an era because Elvis died that year as well, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because people think that was the moment where we no longer thought we could win the European Cup. Would you agree with that? I, I can remember um, it being a massive, massive blow. Um, I, I think, um, again, I kind of think, I don't know if it was in here or if it was actually in here, but when we're talking about the um, Real Madrid game. Um, and that, again, going back to that game, that, that's another reason why I don't think we should have felt that. Um, I know it was way, way later than that, but with the TV money for that game uh, and the home the home gate for that game, that paid Celtic's wages for the season. So that one game? That one game. Mm. So the 2 nothing game. So at that stage, I don't really see why we should have been uh, not competing, you know. Um, but I think probably the biggest reason was um, just uh, they didn't have the same direction, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, that's not necessarily, obviously... Shock steam was something else, um, and that's not to say that Billy or whoever else came in wasn't. Uh, but I don't think they could. I, th I think that football was changing to a degree. It's an interesting thing you said there because there's people writing our, our chances off in '77. The quality sheet gang had broken up almost by then, and uh, by '83 we've got players like Paul McStay and Charlie Nicholas, mm -hmm. who again are on that famous conveyor belt. So, like you say, you know, Scottish clubs in the in the kind of early part of the '80s were still. Mm -hmm. Competing against Europe's finest. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, again, possibly where the differences were and where, it, where it's not so fair now is probably the seedings and all the the pre qualifications and uh, again, it's business, I suppose. It's, um, it's but uh, I think if if the European Cup still was a knockout competition, Celtic might have a far better chance than than they would have because. That, I defy you to go to somewhere harder than Celtic Park if you've got a good Celtic Absolutely. game. Yeah. No, you're Absolutely. right. I mean, the Lazio game last season was another reminder of that, wasn't it, Gary? Phenomenal. When you look at the 80s, as I said to you before, I started going to the games in 1987. That's when I was allowed to start going. The 80s are an interesting one because 87, 88, we win the double. There's the centenary celebrations. But around about that time as well, 1988, there's the... Ibrox revolution as it was described then and for many years afterwards when a, a businessman took over at Rangers and everything changed in Scottish football. Was that the beginnings, do you believe, of the old regime at Celtic Park? That was the beginning of the I end? I think that was a nail in the coffin, a massive nail in the coffin to um, to Celtic. Um, or certainly to... to yeah, no, it, it should have been a kind of wake-up call as to where Celtic, you know... Um, should have been going, but uh, I think they were they were left behind, not just financially, but um, from a probably from a business point of view. Because um, again, it going back at one stage, uh, and it wasn't too far before that. Celtic had the I think they had the best selling football strip in Europe. Yes, you know, and, yeah, you know, and I th they had a phenomenally supported club, and TV money wasn't so wasn't so relevant as it is now so I, you know they should have been able to if, if they had the right if they, if they had the right money um, I think they, they should have been able to compete but I think that was probably where they started to get left behind a wee bit As Celtic fans often do they were a bit of ahead of the curve like I was saying before I should have been like thinking about McAvaney and McStay but I was reading Not The View talking about boardroom battles and sack the board became you know something that started yeah. to creep in yeah, absolutely. You know, and as I said, I think I said to you, I felt very, very sorry for um, some some of the board members at that time. Um, because, again, it wasn't a level playing field. Football had changed from, you know, if, if, you're, an, if you're an apprentice joiner and you showed how to do something one way, you then aren't all of a sudden a cabinet maker. You know, it's, and, and I think that was, that was where the sea change was. The directors always used to have the, the power. The player power was starting to come in a wee bit. Agents were starting to come in a wee bit. Um, and Celtic were a wee bit, unfortunately, a wee bit reactionary, you know. So, um, you know, people always say, where did all the money go? Well, the money might have went on bad signings because Rangers had signed somebody good, and we ended up having to spend money to sign somebody just to appease people, you know. And unfortunately, that happened with a few. But I, I, I do think that uh, 
probably. And, and they did try. Uh, and you know what? When you, when you look at obviously Terry Cassidy and different things and Ryan Dempsey, they did try to bring business businessmen in and, and generate money from within. Uh, no. I, I think it was a very, very difficult time for them because, it, you know, if I think we, we kind of discussed it as it again earlier, where, as I said to you, previously you had not quite tyrants, but you had bosses who determined what the wages were, you know, and, and now market was directing what, what the wages were. And nobody had actually taught, the Celtic board wasn't really, they were Celtic fans. And they were Celtic minded, but they they weren't necessarily uh, as the industry was changing. They weren't m- maybe changing as quickly as they should, or or bringing in necessarily the right the right people to to try and deal with that. And it's, it becomes very difficult to run a shop if you can't buy stock. Yeah, you know, I remember it did get to that stage. I think early nineties. We spoke to Tom Grant a couple of years back yeah. about that period, and he was of the the view that they simply could not go out and buy certain players that they wanted because they couldn't get a line of credit. So that, that w- wasn't as if they were cash rich at that point, uh, yeah, by yeah, that stage. Yeah. The, there was a an experiment, as it turned out to be, with Liam Brady bringing in a, a different type of manager, first manager not to have represented the club. And he spent big. Yeah. Out of all the players that he spent big on, the only one really that you look back on and think, hey, he was probably worth the money was Tony Mowbray. Because you had Gary Gillespie, Stuart Slater, Tony yeah. Casgrain, lots yeah. of money spent. Yeah. After that, I think there was no coming, there was no way back for the board because they had no money, they weren't cash rich. But they did try, like you say, there was first and foremost they brought in Brian Dempsey mm-hmm. and also Michael Kelly. Dr. Michael yeah. Kelly uh-huh. came in. So from a PR perspective, Dr. Michael Kelly was to look after that side of things. And Brian Dempsey was the businessman to bring in some of the business acumen. But one of the things that he was pushing for was a, a move to Rob Royston. You can go through life and, and move move houses, but where you grow up is always your home. You know, and, and I think Celtic Park is should always have been Celtic Park. Yeah, definitely. Was that the biggest issue between Brian Dempsey and the board members? Because he was really pushing to move to Rob Royston and the board were saying, no, we're staying at Celtic Park. Is that where it all started to break down between the two? I think if... Um, I think there was an element of that, you know, and there was also an element of his site, he'd build it. Um, and this is me surmising, you know, but, and Celtic not being able to afford it, you know, in real terms either. But I, th- so I think Celtic has always been, you know, if, if you look at it logically, uh, and Fergus kind of proved it, you know, you, you could turn Celtic Park into anything and he's turned into something special, so... So I don't think we needed to do that, you know, to, to create an Asda, which was now further up the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. so Brian Dempsey leaves, and as you say, Terry Cassidy comes in. So he was the chief executive at the time, wasn't he? Yeah, I believe so, yeah. Introduced a lot of different ways of thinking. Ultimately, it didn't work out. Do you think his relationship with Celtic fans was one of the reasons why? Because Celtic fans didn't accept Terry Cassidy. No, and I think, I think Celtic fans didn't accept the board. You know, so I think... Um, I know Jurgen Klopp wasn't about it. We brought Jurgen Klopp in as a manager. He'd been, he'd been sacked two months later, and that's you know it's Celtic fans weren't happy where the board were and, and where Celtic was, and you know to a degree you can understand why um, because nobody wants to see you as a Celtic fan Rangers doing better than you, and I think that was kind of what was starting. Another massive moment in that whole period was the signing of Morris Johnson. Again, the board are criticised. Big Billy McNeil. Standing there with, with Morris Johnston in the hoops, people say that was really the moment again where it was definitely advantage Rangers. Rangers have got the big stadium, all seater. They're spending millions, and not just that, they're rubbing your nose in it by signing Morris Johnston. Probably the beginning of the end for Big Billy as a manager, actually. But as a board, and again, you're surmising because you're hearing things just like we hear things, and people tell us about what went wrong. What went wrong with the Morris Johnston deal? I would say Mr. McMurdo. <laughs> the long and short of it is massive, massive Rangers man, as everybody knows. Um and but with the same token, don't parade somebody who's been signed if he's not signed. You know, and so so there's a kind of uh, yeah, I mean and I don't you know, I say obviously at that stage that was as a Rangers fan, you you must have been devastated as well. You know, so I think everybody was 
there was just a massive, massive outpouring of hatred towards obviously Mo. Um, Burning season tickets outside oh, Ibrox. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, but so I, I don't really think that you know. Yeah, the board light looks stupid, but at the same time, the, the biggest thing they did was obviously parade them without, without, uh, and and I think they did it thinking, well, it's, it's a done deal, and. And, and they probably thought it was decent PR coming in coming ahead, I think it was ahead of a cup final or something, wasn't it? At the time? It was, I it was. Rangers yes. were going for the yeah. treble yeah. Yeah. at that time. Again, when we look at the fiasco uh, of the Morris Johnson signing and then not signing, it's something that we're still talking about <laughs> today. I mean, it was, it was a shocking moment in Celtic's history. As a board, when you look at the fact that you've been left with your, your pants pulled down, that's one thing. But years and years later, we're talking to Tom Grant and Tom said to us, there was a suggestion that we could have got the deal done, but the payment they were asking for yeah, wasn't right. above board, right? A suggestion, because, I mean, then if Rangers do the deal, if that payment's asked for, then it's been paid. I mean, at any point with discussions, did anybody say, well, where are they getting all this money? Where's this money coming from, talking about Rangers? <sighs> um, Is there a suspicion in the boardroom at that stage at Celtic Park? To, to be fair... I probably don't know is the answer to that, if I'm being honest about it. You know, as I say, my, my information, is, as I said to you, it's all kind of second-hand through family and, 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 and different conversations you have with different people about, about different things. But that that's something I wouldn't have been party to, you know, to be fair. So Celtic's fans, that the groups were set up, Save Our Celts, Celts for Change, there was a movement, the boycotts, they were in consultation by this point with a new party that was coming in Fergus McCann. What was your thoughts around that stage? Did you feel it was time for the dynasties to go, hand it over to someone who could get the investment and think, move into the new era? Well, I think if um, if you look at it, if you if you take yourself and put yourself above it and put yourself above Glasgow and look at it, I think the logical thing is yes. But from my point of view, at that time, I don't know how the board could have could have turned the fans back around. And I don't. I, I think it, it didn't necessarily need to be Fergus that came in, but somebody had to come in. Um, and as, as everybody knows, Fergus did a fantastic job. You know, nobody, I don't think, expected him to do what he did. And he did exactly what he said he was going to do. You know, so um, I would say my, yeah, I think I said to you, my, my, one of my biggest disappointments was likes of Chris, I really liked. I thought he was a really nice man. And, I think the way they were treated latterly, because they were Celtic fans, and uh, it's a shame. But maybe by the same token, um, it just was it was just time time to move. And time, and, and I think obviously it's been proven that if you like the new Celtic, is it's still a Celtic family, which I still think was you know you go back to to my uncle Bob. That's what they they created a Celtic way of football. They created the Celtic view. They created television for Celtic effectively. So. A lot of the stuff that the old regime started is cut is back in fresh and back and back here now with with a new regime and with probably with a, a more with a business strategy and a business plan and, and, a, and a way forward, but still a Celtic family. When we look at that moment, what I think as a fan is Brian Dempsey standing. It's raining. He's on the steps. The game is over. The Rebels have won. But behind the scenes, what was it like for the Kelly family? I think it was probably pretty horrible, you know. Um, I think I'd, I'd said to you, you know, there was, you know, they, they, they knew, that, so it's like probably stabbing a wounded dog, you know. You're, um, you know, you know it's going to go. But I, I, I said to you through next door. I, I can remember. Um, I think I, I think I was long married at the time, but um, my my mum and dad in their kitchen. Uh, or ended up the reason it, I think the reason it came so late was my mum and dad and my uncle Jim um, were doing a deal with their shares, not for financial gain, but to to kind of try and make sure that uh, Kevin was protected. Um, and I think Kevin got an honorary position on the board, and um, I guess you know, that was my, my mum's favourite cousin. So, um, and and in fairness, Kevin loved for Celtic, absolutely loved Celtic and loved for them. So. Um, that was the only probably small saving grace for you know for the family. But having said that, when you look, you know when you look back, and then 
Um, all the families have had, with, with the exception, if you like, the, change, the, the if you like the changing time. The families will all have great memories, and they'll still probably love Celtic as well, you know. So, um, and I know they do actually all still love Celtic. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, and, and life changes, you know. But life changes for everybody. I think I said to you as well. Cost me my season tickets. You know, so, <laughs> so. Yeah, because I think Fergus changed a lot when he came in in yeah. that respect. But to maintain a connection, not just a, an emotional connection, but a connection to the club, like you say. Your your mum and dad had that discussion in the kitchen and that was for the benefit of Kevin. Did anybody during that period benefit financially? I don't think so, because I think there was there was probably times in the past where they could have. Um you know, I, th- I think there was other I, I think there was other people that could have paid a lot more money for their shares, you know. And and in fairness, probably um no, no is the answer to that effectively, mm-hmm. you know. I think Nobody did particularly well out of that, you know, in, in terms of finance or ego, you know, or, or pride or, or whatever you want to call it. Or so. But the thing is, I totally appreciate the pride element of that. Yeah. If you've been born into a family with a connection to a club, there is an element of pride. Yeah. And to want to continue your involvement, and I know Tom Grant continued as a stadium manager for yeah. several years after Fergus came in. Yeah. Is there any revisionism that you hear and you think, well, actually... That's not really what happened in relation to the new regime coming in. I, th- I think you know there's there's always there's elements of I said he said she said and and everybody you know, so yeah I, th- I think there's probably ultimately the right man got the club and did the right thing and that, you know I think that's probably you know uh, he did what he said he was going to do left us with a stadium left us with a legacy and now we've got. A, We've got a good football club and, and a good board, you know. So, you know, I, I, you know, to to go back over that era, I think it was a sad time and a probably sad time for for the directors at that time. Yeah, a sad time for supporters until that actually happened, and then probably um, there was opportunists about, shall we say, that probably benefited, um, not necessarily financially, but put themselves into positions that. For personal benefit, but not necessarily financially more. How important, not only with the, the share issue that then ensued, but how important were the fans to the, the kind of ground movement? You know, they participated in boycotts, etc. Well, how important were I th- they? I think, you, you, again, and I might keep going back to uh, Sir Bob, but Celtic is the fans. Celtic was, was created for, you no, know, it wasn't created for the Kellys, it wasn't created for the Whites, and it wasn't created for Fergus. It was created for people in the East End of Glasgow. It was created for Catholic immigrants to, to have a football club and a place to go. And you know, So Celtic is the fans. Celtic is just a, it's an institution that is, belongs to Celtic fans. When you went back for the first time, like a phoenix from the flames, Celtic Park, you know, this beautiful stadium that we now see, and people are now born into that image of Celtic. Yeah. You know, you can't remember, a lot of them can't remember the old jungle, for example. How did it feel for you? Walking back into that place and it was a different arena. Yeah, I think um, you're, you're coming from Hamden first and foremost, you know, uh, and then you're coming back to you're coming back and you're coming back to Celtic Park, and um, I th- it was strange, but it's Celtic, you know. So you're not going to not support Celtic, um, and. I don't think, from, from my point of view, I was never a director and I was never really anything to do with the club other than I, I, I can tell you my, my anecdotal stories about, because there's, there's connections, but not, they're loose, you know. So so for me, I, I, I probably didn't have the same, I would say, loss of entitlement that maybe some of the other people going back would have, would have had. Um, and I, th- I think at that time as well, um, my... Obviously, my wife's sister was married to Tony Mowbray, so there was there was also an element of you weren't just supporting Celtic; you were supporting family at that stage. Um, so, um, and obviously, but obviously the family side of things there was was tragic. And um, uh, but yeah, no. So, so going back to Celtic was um, it wasn't too hard for me. I say uh, my it was probably like most things that um, I think when you get caught up in the rantings of hearing my mum and dad and different people um, and what their opinions were of people and, and different things then 
you're probably more protective of something that was dying as yeah. opposed as opposed yeah. to you know. Um, Do you think it would have died? As I say, it's one of those ones. It, Celtic would never have died, but it needed the change. You know, um, I mean, Celtic were doing a, the fans were doing a good job of of making the change happen. You know, as I say, as soon as they knew fifteen thousand was the the cut off point, and there was never anybody more than fifteen thousand people at Celtic Park, never. So, so the fans knew they wanted them out, and and I'm sure the directors knew that they wanted. The, well, clearly they didn't know they wanted them out, but. Uh, it's a really difficult question to answer because Celtic fans love the football club and, and if that was all that was open to them, if it was a case of, well, we will board Phoenix and do the bank for nine million quid and then come back, you ain't going to see thirty thousand people going to watch Party Thistle, you know, or, or Clyde or or whatever, you know. So I d but I don't think as I say, I think it's probably worked out best for the best the way it did happen. We've spoken and lamented about the great European days being gone forever, but obviously we have since seen some fantastic European memories, albeit not to the same degree as the 60s and 70s heyday. From the period post-Fergus, if you like, if you want to call it that, the modern Celtic, if you like, what's the, what's the, the memories that spring mind, to mind for you, the special memories as a Celtic fan? Everybody's got the same one, I think, and it's all the way to Seville, isn't it? Um, I... Unfortunately, uh, and when I say unfortunately, maybe it was fortunate. Uh, I gave my father-in-law my ticket, so uh, so I got all the good stuff and not the <laughs> and not the tears that my son gave me. Because I think he was probably about what the TV was about, my oldest boy, was probably about six or seven at the time. So it was just you know he was used to this was going to be Celtic were going to win this, and obviously the special win did us over. So. The special one, yeah, <laughs> that, that is a special one, yeah. yeah. The special one, Josie. Mm. I mentioned Tony Mowbray not to appeal to you. I actually I was there for his debut, I seen his goal against Rangers, and the big thing for me is he introduced the huddle, yeah. which has become part of Celtic's fabric to this day. When he came back as a manager as well, there was high hopes. He was a popular Celtic player. There was high hopes for him. I mean, how difficult was that for you when when it didn't work out for him? Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Um, it was a very difficult time for Tony as well. You know, um, he was obviously Tony and Dre married, and, uh, but the families are still still really, really tight, really, really close. But it was a very difficult thing. But he's uh, he's in Glasgow. His wife and kids are still down south to, for for a good chunk of it. Um, it started off really, really positively. Uh, and in terms of, uh, I can obviously remember the, the the last day of it, which was horrible. My my youngest son at that stage uh, was it was it's an Aloysius, um, and we were coming out. I don't know if it was a parents' night or something else. And unlike uh, it was my parents' nights, I was crying because I'd been battered. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but unfortunately, he was crying because Celtic had been battered. You know? um, but it was you know, in terms of. Tony as a man, you'll never meet a nicer man. And and I think that was probably, you know, within Celtic there's still wee empires and different things and um and I think he was just too nice and too straight um for that. Uh, I understood what he was trying to do and he was given a brief by the board to bring the wages down I mean, dramatically. Um, you know, which is why you go from Lee Naylor to Danny Fox and, and not being disrespectful to, uh-huh. to, to Danny Fox or, or whatever but um, when you're being told to virtually half a budget uh, and then you're probably you know, as I would say for me the, the, the point that probably I don't think Donati should have went you know I, I think at that stage you had probably you had a player that was playing for you and I think that yeah. was probably where um that was probably, I would say, probably the, mis- the mistake that I would, and and that was probably um, Peter that wanted that to happen more so than, than Tony. And, and I think if you, you know, that was just the one area where if it stood his ground there, things might have been a wee bit different. But who, who knows? You know, That's say, interesting. You know, I would also say, you know, I don't think you'll meet a nicer man in football, you know, uh, or a nicer a nicer man anywhere, mm-hmm. uh, um, and a more honourable man. You know, so and I, and I think, yeah, it wasn't 
it wasn't pleasant at the end up for, for anybody. Absolutely, and I think, I mean, we wish him all the best because Tony Moby's name you know, pops up in the podcast quite a bit and it was unfortunate that it didn't work out. But it's an interesting point on Donati because I was looking at his performances and thinking, you know, Tony Mowbray was getting a tune out of Donati, wasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. And then we sold him. He scored against Arsenal, that I think, crazy, last yeah. thing he done. Yeah, you know. And it wasn't for a massive fee either. I think it was maybe just over a million or something, yeah. you know, wasn't he? Uh-huh. Five million pound sale, you know? Yeah, and, and he wasn't air shattering wages, you know, and, and, you know, compared to what he was being asked to, to cull, if you like. Um, but, hey, oh, you know, everybody, you know. How is it for you now as a Celtic fan? We're only going for ten in a row, and you know. Yeah. How does it feel? Um, it's I, I don't think any Celtic fan, I, I, you know, say if we, I'm not kind of jumping about a wee bit here, but you know, you've, got, you've got kids that have never seen Celtic lose, you know, in in real terms now. Um, you know, when you know when I look back to when Rangers were doing nine in a row. You still had the odd Catholic kid wearing a ranger strip, which I'm glad to see isn't happening anymore. You know? But you know, Celtic fans are actually seeing Celtic the way you want them to be, and and I have to say, watching watching them at the weekend, I was a wee bit nervous at the start because obviously Rangers had won, won their game, and you're coming out to Celtic Park with no fans, and I would say certainly second half is as good as I've seen. Any new line inside playing, you know, I just thought the movement was brilliant, like Edward was brilliant, and I think there were maybe one or two players away from being really, really, really good. Yeah. Two, let's say two or three players away from being a really handy team in Europe. For me, that kind of investment is a Julian or an Edward, so Absolutely. another two or three yeah. players of that ilk. And you know, if you get and you spend that kind of money, unless it's a disaster, and we've had a few, yeah, absolutely, over the years, um, you are looking to really improve that side. But what happens after ten in a row? This is a big question. As a as a club, as a business, is it good for Celtic to remain in Scotland? Well, again, you know that goes all the way back to Bob as well. You know, he wanted to play in England, and you know, you go back to obviously Celtic wanted to buy Wimbledon or take Wimbledon's place effectively, and. In terms of Celtic going forward, I think every Celtic fan would take playing in England over, well, not necessarily over 10 in a row, but certainly over 11 in a row. You know? So um, I, I think England would be phenomenal. And it's only, it can only be media driven, it can only be sky driven, or, or whoever else comes in uh, at that stage. Eventually, when you, look at, when you look at the way Man City is now, and it's going to become a total transient game, I think, in the future. I don't think you're necessarily going to. I think you could have uh, Manchester City playing in Abu Dhabi, you know, or you could have Liverpool playing in Kuwait. You know, it just depends where the money is. It's where eventually the football clubs will end up, I think. You know, it's, but if Celtic could be part of that, I think it would be absolutely phenomenal. And in terms of stature and size, they certainly can be. You know, And, and in, in terms of what it would actually do for Glasgow, can you imagine... If you're going to play Manchester United and instead of, you know, you know, you're, you, it probably it probably actually takes away a wee bit of the bigotry, you know, as well because you're actually focusing on better teams than Rangers. Yeah, you know, and bigger teams than Rangers. Are. You're operating on a different level, and and virtually every game. I mean, a Celtic home game for the economy is massive anyway in yeah. Glasgow, ah, but obviously a Champions League game takes it to another level. Yeah, it's like every game would be like that. Yeah, you know? totally, totally. When we go back to the point you made about your Uncle Bob wanting to play outside of Scotland, was the reasons on a sporting level or was it because Scotland at that time was anti-Celtic? I think there was an element of a bit of both. Um, if, if you can remember, obviously Celtic were phenomenal. You know, uh, well, you, I say you can remember, you know, you, you can see it in black and white. But uh, Celtic were brilliant. Um, Rangers were actually not too bad. Um, but outside of that, it's, it wasn't that different from today, you know. So I think for for them to go forward, I mean, European Cup was they were just starting to to do well there. Obviously, the United and games like that, teams like that, are Manchester United. Who would you rather play with? And you know, if, if you can again, if you're getting half a gate, would you rather be Celtic, Albion, Rovers? And I'm not being disrespectful, but or or Celtic, Man United, you know, and, and that's kind of. I'm sure that was the logic behind it, that you're getting absolutely rampacked. 
a bigger biscuit tin every month. <laughs> a bigger biscuit tin. <laughs> well, you're right, because, I mean, obviously Celtic sell a huge proportion of the stadium via season tickets. But the whole thing, and, it, and it's merchandise and it's average revenue per you know punter through the door, everything goes up yeah. if, you, if you're performing at that higher level. I sound as though I'm pushing for it all the time on this podcast because I actually see that there comes a ceiling in Scottish football, Jim. Yeah. And I think we're almost there. We're almost there. And I, the 10 in a row thing is almost a personal achievement for Celtic fans. It's so important yeah. because of what's going before. But then after that, I think serious consideration think, to move out of the Scottish game needs to be had. I think you're right. And uh, the discussion that we had yesterday uh, on, on the, the live a bulletin, I actually said that uh, that I would like to see us move on. And if we get 10 in a row, sorry, when we do get 10 in a row, there's a big satisfaction in there as well. And once you're satisfied and you've reached the goal where you want to reach, then you can move on. Because if we move on, it can never be achieved again. So Celtic, again, will have made history. And when they do make history, you will see lots of change of attitudes again towards Celtic Football Club and the ethos of Celtic Football Club. And I just go back a wee bit here, the flag. I remember my father telling me about it and uh, and how how so much him, my mother and all the families got behind Sir Robert Kelly and the stand that he took back in that day should, should never be forgotten. I know maybe I've repeated that and it's maybe important that we do repeat it, that he stood for us, the immigrants who come into the country and he stood no way is that coming down? This represents the whole history and the ethos of this club. So back to today, 10 in a row will be satisfying. After that, we find our new goal, which should be, in my opinion, the highest tiers of football and where that can take us and where that can lead us into the next era and for new generations and for people that are not even born yet for them to look and say, this is what happened back here, but we're now in this platform and hopefully competing in European finals again. Not just competing, Gary, Paul, in an English league or whatever league, but being the champions of Europe and then going again for a World Club Cup championship and being the rightful winners and being world champions. That's what I would love to see for Celtic Football Club and for the Celtic supporters as as we are all are in this room great Celtic supporters Gary do you ever see a day when Celtic win a European Cup again? on DVD <laughs> no um, I would love to think so you know but I think with the restrictions that the, the board have financially here then I just don't see that's never going to happen here but um, I think you know the, the way they're playing and the way they're going and they're certainly heading in the right direction to maybe do something in Europe on a, on a lesser scale but uh, I, of course I'd love to see it but as, as you know as you guys have, have sort of alluded to the financial restrictions of Scotland are just far too severe I think and also you know the um, the kind of seedings the way they are we, we need to be elsewhere or part of an elite European league or some something will change in the future I'm sure but uh, just now I think I'll be happy with 10 and then see where see where we get from there see where we are from there Gary your family name the Kellys go right back to the very first ball that was kicked for Celtic Football Club and obviously the the family's history is part of the, the club's rich history as well so Jim and I are delighted that you came along to share your memories and your opinions on our great football club and all that's left for us to say is thank you very much for joining us on a Celtic State of Mind. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me here. It's a fantastic place to be. Pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you.